John chapter 3, verse 7, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. So uh, what does it mean to be born again? Well, it means that you give up, you give up your, uh, uh, how can I say this? You give up on your quest to fulfill the flesh, more or less. You give up on your quest in this world to to let your fleshly desires guide everything that you do. And, uh, you know, you die in your sin. And, and, you know, it's what proceeds out of the mouth that is is filthy and dirty and unclean. It's not what goes in the mouth, as Jesus said. It's what comes out of the mouth. So it's very easy to see uh, where people in your life are, um, where their head is at. I mean, it comes right at you in their words. So in studying the word, it is literal. I mean, we study definitions, we study meanings, we study, uh, you know, these profound uh, words that proceed from the mouth of God. And you see, when we accept those words and we bring those into our hearts and we get rid of the old words that had us bound up in sin that means lusting after things of this world lusting after whatever it may be um there are necessities don't get that wrong there are things that you must have to sustain your life however the lord said that uh, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So, to me, what that means is that, you know, when we are born again, we start to replace the corrupted word inside of our uh, own conscious, our own uh, created uh, desires our own created lusts, um, and we replace those with that uh, that God has shown us in his example of Jesus who came here to fulfill his ministry. And, um, you know, the, the real gospel is something that will be revealed but it, it's something that you you must take in due season you don't you know that the truth is a quest and uh we're all we're all subject to different principalities different powers different uh, rulers of the darkness of this world and uh it's up to us as individuals to discover what has been placed on our own heart in our own mind in our own spirit in our own soul and to remove those stumbling blocks takes time takes energy so marvel not that uh that we are to remove those stumbling blocks, those desires, those wicked, uh, sinful um, things that have gotten in the way of uh, of being uh, uh, whole again and being uh, conscious again in Christ's kingdom. Uh, when we come to Christ's kingdom, um, then... None of these fleshly things really have any power on us anymore. We are free in the sense that we're not bound to the things and the desires of this world. We are bound to 
the the liberty that Christ came and gave us. So it's an amazing process and it takes time. It's not uh, something that happens overnight, but the very first step is to uh, come to the Lord Jesus Christ and sacrifice one one's own uh, past desire, so to speak, past um, um, you know your own deep desire, your own deep seated uh, sins. And uh, that's not so easy to do because we are wicked, fallen, sinful people. And I'm no different than anyone. Uh, I'm another seeker of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I have to seek him daily. I can't... Um, I can't uh, go back to who I was because if I did, um, it would it would destroy me. Um, as a as a newborn believer, your whole life is transformed. Um, your life takes on an entire new meaning. It's not the same. Uh, you may look at the world as your oyster and that would be a mistake because clearly uh, we are not to regard this life as having supreme authority over us but there are those that do and as a born-again believer you marvel not that uh, marvel not at this is it says in John uh, 5 28 for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice so we're gonna have to bear witness to everything we've done everything we've said and you know that's that sounds like a lot but Don't overburden yourself either with that statement. Um, that's why we need to be seated with the Lord Jesus. He uh, will save us from our sin when we are dead to sin, when we have died to sin, when we have died to lust, when you no longer seek after the things of this world. And... Uh, you know, there are tools, there are um, objects that we acquire, you know, in our daily lives. And we have jobs and we have um, connections and we serve, we serve this, uh, this self to some degree. And um, I guess I, I'm just kind of, trying to work this a little bit and understand it myself too I'm, I'm not um, I'm not perfect either uh, I have flaws as uh, all of us do we're all fallen people and um, coming to grips with uh, a fallen wicked person that lives inside of you is not easy but it becomes easier and um, you need to determine who is the violator inside and who has violated you inside of you and uh, the minute that you come to Christ is the minute that you start seeking his word and the minute you start seeking his word then his word starts to cleanse that inside of you and you become a new creature um, that's the best way I can describe it right now 
being born again. So, you know, I just wanted to do a quick little something about that. And uh, I think it's really important that we talk about um, being born again and knowing Christ. And it's a daily process. And dying to our sin, dying to our old self, is something I've probably been working on slowly for many, 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 many years. But uh, it's it's uh, a layer of an onion at a time. I mean, you're working to get the core problem on inside the onion, but um, you can't get to that core without working on the outside first. And um, sure, you can cut the onion open, but the best way is to peel it back layer by layer um, so you understand um, if you take the shortcut of uh, of cutting it then you destroy the core and um, you know when you cut right into a, a problem to solve it then you divide it in half and it becomes more difficult to define that problem rather than seeing the whole problem looking at the whole um, you can you know rotate the onion and, and look at the different sides but if you cut straight to the core right away then you divide it and I guess that's an example I can spiritually use um, as to um, you know, let me give this example. When I was young, you know, I was going to a Lutheran church and uh, we were taught to be born-again Christians in the Lutheran church. Well, that's an entire different meaning. It's more of a synthetic uh, born-again. In other words, I think you just cut through the layers and get straight to the core and you become uh, divided in your understanding and you have um, two different onions now and now you're serving two different masters. You're serving the outside master that everyone sees on the surface and inside the Bible tells us that inside we're wicked uh, where is that? Uh, I should look that up too. We're wicked. We're um, dirty, filthy. Uh, our righteousness is but filthy rags. And um, so, you know, I think becoming a servant of our Lord Jesus is... Uh, much more to it than just a, a quick fix and you know claiming that born again is going to really fix you well you have to really take it slow and look at all of the detail and gain a clean understanding and I think that comes with age it doesn't come when you're young so easily it's it's really hard that way, uh, I must say. Um, you know, that maybe there is a, a, a really good uh, understanding when you're young, but when you grow, um, then things do change over time, and they change gradually, and um, things get snuffed out, little, little, little... Uh, um, um, points of light that you've come, uh, Bible truth, you do get uh, blocked in when you go into the darkness of, uh, of youth and when you're living a youthful life. And um, I must say that, you know, in the mind, in terms of a mind, when you get older, it's easy to snap right back into a, a youthful um, uh, understanding and uh, to deal with these youthful um, constructs 
that are created in our youth and then coming back to them um, triggers, you know. Um, being a musician myself, I can definitely say that uh, there is a lot more to uh, to understanding that meets the eye and uh, it's really about your mind and the mind is a very uh, intricate thing and a delicate thing and um, it's just as delicate as your personality can be um, and of course personalities aren't necessarily delicate at all there is a lot of very uh, brash and uh, and um, potent personalities out there. I don't happen to think that I'm one of them, but um, perhaps I am at times and I'm not even aware of it. You know, this is the thing. You know, we're, we're not even really aware of what we do sometimes. Um, that's how complicated life really is. Um, Jesus said on the cross, right? He said that, uh, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I often think of that too. You know, uh, do I really know what I'm doing? Um, well, I I must say, uh, you know, when I plant myself into the Word of God, then I feel comfortable. But everything else um, becomes subject to the self, and um, it's an amazingly uh, in a staggeringly difficult time that we live in now. Um, I remember years ago when my brother sent me a video called The Century of the Self. The first episode is Happiness Machines by BBC. Um, it's really hard to find that video, but it is out there. Um, that's a fantastic example of where we're coming from, uh, you know, just in recent history, never mind about age, ancient history. Um, and that's the thing now. Um, we're living in such a time where we have access. This is the information age. We have access to huge, vast amounts of information. Now, some of that information is hidden pretty well but it's still there. Uh, there are uh, traces of, of, of uh, information that has been suppressed as well. And um, this is uh, the thing, you know, we're, we're, we're living in a time where there is so much corruption that it's overwhelming. And um, so as individuals, uh it's hard it's it's really difficult so i just thought the uh the urge and the need of of talking about uh my own little personal uh walk here today was important and um kind of letting down my guard a little bit and uh and just uh not worrying about um uh, you know what I put out there in in terms of of the world because really it comes down to uh, what Christ did at the cross. I mean, uh, just look at our our method of of um, uh, time, and you have B.C. and A.D. before Christ and after death. Um, it points right to Christ, and and that is universal. So, of course, that's Catholic. Um, and uh, you know, studying Roman Catholicism and um, contrasting that to Protestantism is uh, just the most uh, fascinating study, and um, that's really what we must do. Is individuals we must um study this so uh i'm gonna just take this phone call and i'll come right back all right so i'm back and uh i would like to read some scripture to everyone and uh, the scripture that i was referring to earlier 
well, um, it kind of runs along these lines of of uh, the uh, the three that bear witness in heaven in First uh, John five. Uh, chapter 5 verse 7 but I'm going to start with 1st John chapter 3 and just uh, read this and um, just let this sink in and you can read open up your Bible and read along with me if you prefer Um, again that's 1st John chapter 3 uh, beginning at verse 1 behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew not him. Excuse me, it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear that we shall be but we know that when we sh- when he shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth transgresseth the law. Also the law, excuse me. For sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Okay, and I'll stop right there, verse 6. So, this is how important it is to die to sin and not partake in sin. We cannot be sinners to enter into the kingdom of Christ. We need to rest in Christ. That means we need to abide in his law. That means we follow his commandments from the Old, to, the Old Testament to the New. It's a big, big process. So, okay, back to uh, chapter 3, verse 7. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness... Is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever doeth doeth not righteousness, is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Okay. So what does it mean not to love your brother? To not treat him as yourself. To cast him down. And um, isn't it interesting how families divide? You know, I have an older brother. And... um, we don't live together, and I'm very grateful for that. But, uh, you know, he's still my brother, and uh, I'm glad we're on good terms. So, uh, back to verse 11. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, 
and slew his brother. And wherefore slew him slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He that loveth, loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, as ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, that we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whosoever hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of the compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not li- or let us not love in word. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight and this is the excuse me and this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandment And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he is, and he in him. Okay, so there's an exchange here. I'm sorry, I may have read that a little funny. Um, And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. So, that's interesting takes a little from my brain to think about that Uh, and hereby we should know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us now isn't that an amazing thing so as far as I understand this we're in this life right now living our lives and the farther we reach to the word of God and, and take on that spiritual clothing and, and um, clothe ourselves in his word, um, then he resides more in us. The more willing we are to let go of the self and all of the sin that comes with that, the more we are transformed into his likeness and it's an amazing process it really truly is so i quick wanted to uh it's probably really good to read the whole thing but i was going to go to uh, chapter five here and just read down to verse oh i don't know i think it was around 12 or something um whosoever believeth that jesus is the Christ is born of God and every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments 
For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not that not the record that God gave his son and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life and this life is in his son he that hath the son hath life and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Now that's the end of verse 12. So First John um, chapter 5. And uh, that's pretty much what I wanted to review quick. And um, Okay, I'm back again. Sorry about that. Uh, I got interrupted there earlier on uh, today. And uh, now a few hours has passed and... Uh, I've been uh, listening to this recording and uh, just uh, deciding that uh, there's one more um, quote I have to add to this from the History of Protestantism, Volume 1, Chapter 1. Um, I'm sure that uh, many of you uh, that are familiar with, uh, with James A. Wiley's writings probably already read this, but um, this is just... Uh, earlier I was mentioning um, before the, I got the phone call that uh, that uh, studying uh, Roman Catholicism and then contrasting that to uh, Protestantism is important and um, uh, it just becomes more clear, more and more clear as you study uh, uh, this Roman Catholicism and uh, just exactly how devious and how downright diabolical uh, the uh, principles involved here. Um, They stem from Babylonian times. Um, They are uh, very powerful forces that are at work inside of the Roman Catholic system, the Roman Catholic machine. And uh, Protestantism was the protest that came from within the Roman Catholic system. So it was, well, anyway, I'm going to read this quote from uh, the last portion. It's the last paragraph of uh, the history of Protestantism uh, volume 1, chapter 1, the very last paragraph. It starts out, well, I'll let go two paragraphs because that's a short one. So it starts out at, we repeat our question. 
whence came this principle? And we ask our readers to mark well our, our answer, for it is the keynote to the whole of our vast subject and places us at the very outset at the springs of that long narration on which we are now entering. Protestantism is not solely the outcome of human progress. It is no mere principle of perfecti perfectibility inherent in humanity and ranking as one of its na uh, native powers in virtue of which when society becomes corrupt, it can purify itself, and when it is arrested in its course by some external force, or stops from exhaustion, it can recruit its energies and set forward anew on its path. It is neither the product of the individual reason nor the result of the joint thought and energies of the species. Protestantism is a principle which has its origin outside human society. It is a divine graft on the intellectual and moral nature of man, whereby new vitalities and forces are introduced into it, and the human stem yields henceforth a, new, a nobler fruit. It is the descent of a heaven-born influence which allies itself with all the instincts and powers of the individual, with all the laws and cravings of society, and which, quickening both the individual and the social being into, new, a, excuse me, into a new life, and directing their efforts to nobler objects permits the highest development of which humanity is capable and the fullest possible accomplishment of all its grand ends. In a word, Protestantism is revived Christianity, unquote. So that ends my reading for today. And thanks for listening, everybody. And please let me know what you think if you made it this far through my uh, my little uh, um, uh, what should I say uh, Bible study here. I guess I'm going solo, um, trying this out for the first time. I've never really read scripture on my channel before, but uh, at least this much and. Uh, I'm just hoping that um, I can uh, provide a little bit of a blessing. Um, where was that? I, I can actually close with uh, some more scripture here. Um, now that I think of it, I um, came across one that I really, really like lately. I believe it's 1 Peter chapter 3. So if you want to open up your Bible, 1 Peter chapter 3, along with me. And um, let's see. Uh, so First Peter chapter three, verse eight. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrariwise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and let his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil, and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you, if ye be followers of that which is good? 
But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready to give an answer. Excuse me, let me start again from the top of 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not putting away, or excuse, excuse me, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him. And that ends my reading, and I pray you have a blessing today, and I thank you for listening, and God be with you. Bye.